For this lecture on forgiveness, we talked a little bit about what forgiveness is, why it can benefit the self, and how we go about practicing it. Um, so it turns out that forgiveness is on a continuum with grief, and that oftentimes the problem is either that we grieve too long, in other words, we end up ruminating and feeling resentment about the hurt that's been inflicted on us, or we skip the grief process altogether. In other words, we avoid grief or avoid conflict. And forgiveness, true forgiveness, is that that comes on the other side of the grief process. And so part of what forgiveness involves is the uncovering, instead of the denying or the repressing, of the kind of pain that we've experienced and the wrongdoing that was done to us. After this uncovering process, Forgiveness requires intentional thought and a real decision about what it is that forgiveness is going to mean in this particular situation. That's in contrast to passively avoiding the wrong that was done. This is what you might call decisional forgiveness. In other words, it's a behavioral intention to forgo my right or my feeling, my desire for revenge or for avoidance or to punish the other person socially. After this, part of the stage in forgiveness involves empathically understanding the person who hurt us. This is very different than distorting them or splitting them, either as someone who's pure evil or as someone who's incapable of that wrong. And part of this empathic process involves share, finding the shared humanity between you and the other person and may, if possible, involve asking questions to help clarify who they are and what they were going through. And, uh, Forgiveness involves the releasing instead of the bearing of anger and hatred, and this is what's referred to as emotional forgiveness, in which we replace negative emotions with positive ones, other-oriented emotions like compassion and care. And ultimately in the end, in what's called the deepening phase, we tend to find redemptive meaning in the suffering. This isn't saying, I'm glad the suffering happened, but it's saying that there's a meaning that I can take from my experience here. This is in contrast to denying the importance of the suffering. Um, as you're doing the deepening process, you can apply the experience of being hurt to other people. In other words, it enables you perhaps to deepen your compassion for others. So note here the link with compassion. It also enables you to think of those people in your life that you've hurt and perhaps offer an apology to them. And this offers the chance to see life as being richer on the other side of this suffering experience. Some of the reasons to practice forgiveness, it tends to actually improve physiological health and lowers our depression levels. People who practice forgiveness also show lower levels of anger and decreases in stress. And ultimately, forgiveness is most helpful because it preserves our relationships and it enables us to repair the tears that have been done. But how do we go about actually forgiving someone? Well, first, we talked about the prayer before the prayer. This is similar to the pre-contemplation or the contemplation stage in which I wish or hope for the ability to even want to forgive. But forgiveness involves also dispelling some of the myths of forgiveness. In other words, figuring out what forgiveness is not. The forgiveness does not require me to forget or condone or excuse the other person's wrong behavior. It doesn't even require me to trust the other person unless they've given me reason to trust them. And it certainly doesn't require me to forgo justice for the wrongs that have been done. Ultimately, we can promote forgiveness when we recognize, first, the role of negative emotions, the positive role of negative emotions, and actually allow them in the uncovering process. Allow anger to give us energy and power, help us in the midst of feeling loss of control. Allow fear to help protect us and guide us from harm in appropriate situations. Allow our feelings of hurt to come up because this can actually serve as a source of comfort and allow even in the beginning those feelings of rumination and resentment to the degree that they can energize us and remind us that something here has been threatened and it needs to be restored. But we need to also be able to recognize when those negative emotions have calcified after serving their purpose because chronic anger 
can end up reinforcing a sense of powerlessness. Chronic fear can cause me to avoid intimacy and other opportunities for relationship and support. Chronic resentment can actually lead me into a place of victimization and shame. And so what I may do is to try to re-attempt forgiveness after I've initially tried and failed. So how do I do this? Well, I want to consider deeply the other person. What was it like for them to grow up? What kind of life issues might they have had to deal with? Their stresses were they under when they committed the act against me? Can I think of them as a human being deserving of compassion? Can I imagine any, to any extent the kind of suffering that they have gone through? If I can do this even to a small degree, then I can work to try to expand those moments of empathy a little bit at a time. And when I need reminding as to why I'm doing this, I can always go back and regard those benefits of forgiveness, what you might think of as enlightened self-interest. You can also work with a surrogate, a trusted, safe other person to whom you can express your original hurt and anger and let them stand in and eventually even role play the way that the other person might respond, both positively and negatively. And when they respond negatively, this gives you a safer place to practice responding with grace and kindness. Also, open up in vulnerability to talk to them about your current fear and your hurt. When you are the transgressor, there are certain things that you can do to actually make forgiveness more likelihood, more likely. One of those involves apologizing, but only apologizing after you've tried deeply to understand your actions from the perspective of the person that you've hurt. This has become this is because there are some biases that affect the transgressor, like the magnitude gap, the fact that you have cost way more hurt than you've gained in pleasure or benefit. And so this requires a real attentive listening and a desire to in an attempt to try to express remorse. It turns out remorse is the strongest predictor of whether forgiveness ends up being successful because it elicits in the person who's been harmed empathy. So note here the link with another virtue, an offer to repair. Finally, you can go through the forgiveness exercise that we did at the very end, in which you relax and breathe. Picture yourself grounded to the earth and filled with light, grounded almost with roots. And to visualize not the person, but the pure soul or the essence of the person who hurt you. And to speak to that soul and tell them about your hurt and to set boundaries and perhaps give them permission to show up differently in your life. Allow them to break out of the stereotyped box that your anger has kept them in. Allow love to fill the darkness in your own heart and perhaps even offer them mentally a gift without any kind of expectation of return. These are some of the ways that we can practice and enhance our capacity for forgiveness.